Uh, my name is Ralph Wolf, and I'll be moderating the discussion with our three panelists. Uh, by way of background, I want to say in working with uh, the World Academy and the World University Consortium, we've been looking for new models of education that could address human security. And one of the biggest issues of human security is really climate change. And in searching uh, for who would be good today, there are three, our three panelists, I think, have a tremendous amount to offer. I want to um, begin with a quote uh, from one of our panelists. Actually, Brian, it's in your book, um, Academic ne Academia Next, but it's actually from the introduction and it's from Clay Shirky, but it says the biggest threat those of us working in colleges and universities face isn't video lectures or online tests. It's the fact that we live in institutions perfectly adapted to an environment that no longer exists. And I would submit that the environment is pedagogical, it's demographic, but it is also with respect to the larger issue of human security that we have a challenge of preparing people for jobs in the future that have not yet been created and for a future that is entirely different from the ones in which we've been educated. And we're going to need to be able to provide education at a scale never, never done before, a uh, level of uh, interdisciplinarity uh, to address uh, the what we call the wicked problem the, that we're currently facing in the future. So that led to uh, identifying uh, three great panelists, and we're going to do it as a kind of a way of a back and forth and dialogue and begin with some brief um, some brief introductions and then take on some topics that all will address. So let me begin. Um, just with some brief introductions, and uh, we'll ask each describe the uh, how they've been addressing climate change and the to the extent the larger issue of human security as we're focusing on in this conference. Uh, let me begin with uh, Brian with you, Brian Alexander, and who's just uh, written a book that will come out next month. Universities on Fire, Higher Education, and the Climate Crisis. So, Brian, uh, what led you to write that? And tell us uh, briefly about yourself. Well, thank you very much for the uh, uh, opportunity and the uh, organization, Ralph. And greetings to my two esteemed co-panelists, Ashley and Mark. And thank you to everybody who has joined us for this discussion. Uh, I'm a futurist specializing in the future of higher education. So normally I work with colleges, universities, along with nonprofits, businesses, and governments that work in that space. And for my previous book, I was working on the next generation of American higher education. Well, after that came out, I wanted to focus on a longer term picture for the rest of the century on global higher education. And as I started working on that, I realized that there wasn't a lot of work being done on the impact of climate change. Now, in the futurist profession, everybody's focused on climate change. In fact, the idea is if you don't talk about climate change, you're committing something close to professional practice. So I started diving into this and looking more closely at what the climate crisis might mean for higher education and discovered the problem was actually much deeper, much broader, and much more interesting than it first seemed. Uh, and the more research I did, the more questions arose, and that's the way you make a book. Um, I mean, really, really quickly, uh, I broke this down into several different domains, how higher education connects with the climate crisis. One is the intersection of the physical campus, everything from uh, buildings and vehicles to uh, travel and food on campus. The second is the whole research enterprise, how faculty and staff research the climate crisis across almost every single discipline available right now, which has implications for interdisciplinary support and transdisciplinary work. This then naturally leads to the question of how we teach climate and how that works, again, through interdisciplinary teaching in terms of a curricula, but also in terms of pedagogy. And then all of the, everything I've just said is basically the campus, the academic community in isolation, but we're not in effect in isolation. We engage with our local communities, and those communities provide all kinds of oppor opportunities for collaboration, for research, for service learning, as well as for political friction and tension. And beyond that, 
academia to some extent as a player on the world stage. After all, our academic research constitutes a huge chunk of what we know about the climate crisis. And there's an interesting question. To what extent should academia play a broad role? Should we lobby legislators? Should faculty and staff take up roles as public intellectuals? Uh, how do we consider this crisis and respond to it at a strategic level on the world stage? I think all of those domains are up for grabs right now in higher education. And that's what I've been working on. Well, it sounds like a great plug for your book, and I, uh, I myself have pre-ordered it. It's, uh, it's on Amazon and ready uh, to be uh, distributed in or published in April. Uh, Mark, you um, led a cross-campus uh, faculty learning community on climate change. Tell us a little bit about how that got started, and uh, we'll dive deeper into that during the course uh, uh, during the course of our conversation today. All right, thank you. And uh, nice to be on this panel as well. Um, the COVID lockdown uh, taught everyone, including faculty, how to use Zoom. Um, so last spring, we brought together uh, 62 faculty from six different California State University campuses, uh, representing over 30 academic disciplines into the multi-campus faculty learning community. Um, during seven sessions, um, we covered the science behind climate change, the solutions able to counter it, uh, the need to incorporate justice into the conversation, and the enormous anxiety this produces in our students. Um, Climate-fueled wildfires have impacted our campuses, all the campuses in California, and students want to talk about this. Um, one of the reasons, though, that faculty have a hard time talking about climate change in a meaningful way is that the topic is so big. Um, philosopher Timothy Morton has termed the, the term hyperobject to describe things that are so massively distributed in time and space that it's hard for humans to comprehend them, things like climate change. Um, and if climate change is too big to comprehend, it's also too big for any one department or discipline or college or even a set of curriculum that we could bring to the faculty. So for our faculty learning community, we brought in piles of teaching materials and let faculty sort through them to see what they, they could use. Um, faculty heard from 20 different speakers from inside and outside academia, and they connected them with a broad range of approaches and ideas, as well as resources, lots of resources. I'll drop the link in the chat here in a second. Um, and then we put the faculty into interdisciplinary breakout rooms based by discipline, right? Um, uh, and in that, we allowed them to kind of talk amongst themselves and see how they could use the stuff that they found. Um, in essence, we crowdsourced the curriculum development from the faculty themselves in these, in these breakout rooms. Um, a phrase that really motivated our community is that in the future, every job will be a climate job. And here in the Cal State system, uh, we train the future workforce. And so we took it to mean that every class could be a climate class. And so by the end of the session, 75 courses spanning all fields of study, uh, from Plato's to polymers, as we like to say, um, have been redesigned to include a greater uh, emphasis on climate change and resilience. So that's what we did over here. Yeah, we'll dive into more of that. It's a very exciting project. And do put the resources in the in the chat. Uh, Ashley, uh, you represent an organization that uh, serves uh, 900 colleges and universities that for, to my knowledge, uh, for a quarter of a century or more has been really addressing interdisciplinarity, wicked problems and the like. Uh, how is AAC, uh, the American Association of Colleges and Universities, AACNU, uh, how has it been involved in this? And uh, tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I just want to echo Brian and Mark's comments and gratitude for the opportunity to be with you all today and to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I will certainly bring a, a broad view to this in terms of how we're working across um, multiple institutions to achieve the, the kinds of things that, that Brian and Mark are, are working so intensively on. I'll say just the 30 second bit about AACNU and its background, because we're situated a little bit uniquely in the higher ed landscape in the United States, we'd say globally. And that is that we are an association that doesn't serve a single sector or a single stakeholder. We are an association that unites those 900 or so in institutions around an idea. And that idea is, a, is that we work to promote the democratic purposes of higher education by advancing 
equity, innovation, and excellence in liberal education. And now liberal education itself can be a contentious term. And I, I can say that that's because the liberal, in, in our view, is not a political ideology, it's a philosophy. And that philosophy at its root, it comes from the Latin word liber, which is to free. So we are an association dedicated to the kind of education that frees students' minds, that allows them to think for themselves, that equips them with the skills to do that. And so very specifically, Ralph, to your question, um, I think we work around that to advance uh, the, kinds of, the kinds of learning around the existential questions of our time in, in three important ways. And, and Mark began to get to it too with the work that they're doing at Chico. Um, Cal State Chico, which is how do you how do you unite students around a kind of shared objective, uh, a set of shared learning outcomes that equip them with the capacities to be civic actors, to be change agents in ways, again, that they find fit for their own identity and their own purposes. But part of it is that is that shared objective. The second part is the integration of it. Mark alluded beautifully to that. So what does it mean to unite disciplines uh, rather than silo them? Einstein said that the liberal arts were branches of the same tree. And we almost never think of it that way as we go about setting forth the curriculum in ways that are transparently connected to a kind of shared objective. So that integration becomes really key. And the final point, I think one of the very specific ways that we work to do this at AACNU is by leveraging general education curriculum, the part of the curriculum that is the broadest, that, that not only has the capacity to do this kind of integrative work, but it's the part of the curriculum that touches all students. So in terms of commitments to equity, it becomes absolutely essential to think about how we embed this kind of learning and teaching within that part of the curriculum and part of student's journey. That's great. In fact, in uh, an interchange I had with Brian, he called uh, the need for interdisciplinary approaches to climate change the new liberal arts. So uh, exactly the foundation cuts across everything. Uh, we thought we might uh, tackle students, faculty, and institutional change as kind of topics for you all to, to dive into. Uh, Mark, you started this because of student calls. I just read an essay called uh, that talked about student militant apathy and uh, uh, and the need to penetrate or break that kind of apathy, particularly in a post-COVID environment where some students have returned to campus but having lost a year of study or something like that. But you started because of students, and I wonder if we could all engage the issue of how do we engage students, what do they need, and where are they to address this, this the biggest issue that they will face in their futures? So how did well, you I begin guess, with students? Yeah, okay. Well, our, our effort did start uh, in the fall of 2018 following the campfire. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's the largest, most destructive, it's not largest, most destructive uh, fire in California history. And um, I had a student who started off the faculty learning community, uh, the, the faculty learning community with a video talking about why it was so important for them to do this. And they mentioned that climate change was always something they, they knew about and they cared about, but it became real when the town next to them started falling as ash down around them. I mean, this paradise that we lost the entire town is only 10 miles away. Um, and so, you know, this was something that they then came back and our, our class was, our campus was closed for three days, uh, for three weeks, I'm sorry. Um, and when students came back, they started asking about climate change. They wanted to know, why, why are we talking about this? And, and they were talking about it in all of their classes, not just their science classes. Um, they were getting to their art class. They were talking about their philosophy class. They were talking about it in their English classes, right? Um, and they wanted to see it talked everywhere. And so that, that following spring, the students on our campus actually came up with a student initiative for their student ballot that called for climate change to be taught in all fields of study. They wanted it across the campus. And 84% of the students said yes. It was, an, it was an overwhelming call from students. And so the university responded um, with our faculty learning community. Um, a really top takeaway, I think it was the top takeaway from our faculty learning community that climate anxiety in our students is real. And, and how we teach about it may be making it worse. Um, 
we talk about the problem of climate change way too much and not, nest, not nearly enough about the solutions. They really want to know uh, more about solutions. Um, probably one of the most popular resources that we had for the faculty learning community was Project Drawdown. They claim that they're the leading source of climate solutions. And they've collected over 80 existing solutions that can get us to that point of drawdown, right? So the, the solutions exist and our students need to know that um, and they need to talk about it. Um, they also are really just anxious about climate change. And so another really great resource that we pulled up was Britt Ray's new book, Generation Dread, um, trying to find purpose in an age of climate uh, crisis. And so these are the types of things uh, uh, to do. And so one of the things that I did in my class just to kind of respond to this, this great concern is that now I start every class when I lecture with a solution to the problem I'm going to lecture about later. I start with the solution and my students really say they come up afterwards and thank me um, because it really helps with their mental health as they're trying to deal with all of these types of things. So that's kind of what we did with our, our working our group and I'll let others share what they're doing as well. That's great. Well, it's very inspiring as well. And uh, you might put a link or I know it's in your resources on Project Drawdown, but it, that's a something I hadn't heard of before, but it's so solution centered. And I think your point, students need solutions. Uh, it's so depressing to read only about the sixth extinction and the problems without uh, an idea that there are solutions we can enact right now. Let me ask uh, Ashley and Brian, uh, how, how do you see students? I know High impact practices is, is uh, something that we talk a lot about in the U.S. about engaging and immersing students in actually applying and doing the kinds of things that will provide meaning and purpose to their education and keep them uh, pursuing it, uh, not dropping out and uh, uh, dealing with uh, an overwhelming crisis of mental health issues. So I wonder how would you all address uh, the issue of uh, jobs, not uh, skills, not degrees, how in higher education is really about jobs anymore, not about, uh, Ashley, as you were talking about uh, global leadership and citizenship, it's very economically driven. How do we bring students into this new new idea that climate change is about all it is all jobs will be climate jobs that's what mark has been telling us yeah let me let let me echo something that that mark noted which is that was just that sense of purpose which is finding what it means for students to not just work on real world problems we've been saying that for a long time in higher education i think we're moving to a model in which it's real world problems of consequence, right? A real world problem could be not being able to get to the grocery store on time. <laughs> I mean, but we're, we're talking about big existential issues and those do inspire a kind of anxiety um, and coping. It, it strikes me in coming into this question that the Gallup organization has been studying well-being for decades and they do it through a, a multi-part model that looks at elements of physical well-being, financial well-being, social well-being, community well-being, might have all of them exactly right, but, but one of the five is purpose well-being and they most closely link it to one's job because it's basically the place where you spend the most amount of your time. And it's the place where you tend to express that sort of biggest sense of what, what your purpose is. Among those five dimensions, purpose or career well-being is the most consequential for one's overall mental health. So we cannot separate the idea of helping students to find their identity and what they do in these in these situations um, and, and as they grapple with these real world problems. I'm mindful that my my two my two panelists, as wonderful as they are, are both at institutions that have are deeply committed to this. Brian at Georgetown and a Jesuit institution that has as part of its mission Cura Personnels, which is self-care. Um, and Chico State has been an early leader in, in identifying a kind of ethic of care for its students. Been doing that again for like well over a decade. Um, and I mentioned both of those examples because it's so critical for institutions to find their authentic commitment and their authentic path into how they're shaping not just in any individual program, but really putting an institutional commitment around these things. Um, and, and the last the last thing I'll say here is that 
in terms of, we know these will be hard for students. There, there is anxiety. We've known this actually for a long time with students' community engagement, period. Grappling with the idea that you cannot change the world in 15 weeks. It will not change in a semester. So the reality of what it means to make incremental change, to make contributions, to be empowered to have a voice, that is hard, but it's exactly what we should be asking of the kind of education that is not transactional, that is life affirming and consequential and purposeful. That's great, I agree. And Brian, uh, in your research, how have you found working with students and where are they? Because in the US, there are places where you can't even use the word climate change um, as a matter of governmental policy. There are other places where uh, we see this with diversity, equity, inclusion, that it's been eliminated. Uh, it's a th How are students able to engage this issue if it can't even be talked about? Well, well, first of all, I just want to second what my co-panelists have said. Uh, the work Chico State is doing is terrific and ahead of the curve. And uh, I'm really, really glad to uh, learn from Ashley's perspective, which is so, so humane. Um, well, uh, I mean, it's important to realize that there are a lot of spaces for for solutions. I mean, we're seeing a huge ferment in that. Uh, uh, one of the spaces that I'm especially fond of is the solar punk design movement. Uh, which occurs in the visual arts and gaming and in stories. And I think that's trying to imagine a solar punk college or university, I think, is a good exercise. Uh, I think one thing we found as well is that students actually doing climate work, I mean, not just, you know, doing classwork and doing research and doing more than that, you know, service learning, uh, working with local communities. We found that they tend to have better mental health as a result. I mean, so actually climate activism may be a, a very mentally therapeutic task to follow, uh, which I think is something that a lot of higher education can uh, heed. There's also the fact that we're seeing an, an increasing demand for not just green jobs, but climate jobs. I've heard from a bunch of different big companies, including Amazon, that they're trying to hire people who can help them be more green to prepare for the climate uh, crisis as it continues to unfold. And I think that's a, you know, that's a straight shot for a lot of people, uh, a lot of students in academia. I think we're also not I, in in futures work we're always tempted by generational models um you know they're they're great big clumsy things that aren't really that useful but they speak to us emotionally in many ways um and i, I think we can though identify huge differences in generations between traditional wage undergraduates and their elders uh the you know teenagers right now have way more interest in climate change they have they're much more passionate about it they tend to re identify it as a much more important problem than uh people older than them and i think uh, as as mark said this is something that we can really respond to uh pedagogically institutionally um and and beyond that i i think it's important to remember that greta thunberg is college age that the activists who were you know splattering pieces of uh, art in europe some of them were college students uh, I, I think we can speak in terms of how a college or university plans in a top-down way or through shared governance, but we should also remember that activism is unpredictable and can be chaotic, and we should plan to see more and more of that from our students. And keep in mind that there are students now, but some of them will become our staff and our faculty in a very short time. Uh, I, I think we should also keep in mind that our students are increasingly coming from a world marked by climate change. And, and that means in part that some small number of them now, but a growing number will come from areas that are marked and impacted by the climate crisis and lives that are impacted by that. So we have the real challenge of how do we honor that background and do so with care for the, for the students as people. At the same time, at an extreme level, uh, we should expect to see a small but growing number of students who have traumatic experiences of climate disasters, and we need to figure out how to support them using trauma-informed pedagogy. So I, I, I guess you know we have several different ways of engaging uh, right now, Ralph, trying to think about ways that campuses can do this. It really needs to be a multi-pronged, multiple-domain approach. Thank you. That's I guess, really I helpful. Just, add, just really quick, uh, um, yeah. I added a couple of, of more links in there. Uh, Drawdown does have one that's specifically your job. 
Uh, one of the things I think I also included Britt Ray's Substack, um, uh, Gen Dread, that, that folks can read. And I think one of the things to, to be mindful of is that not everyone's going to be an activist. And so we can't just use activism as that one all on, only off ramp in that sense. And I, I get back to uh, what Ashley was saying is that most most people's major or major time commitment is their job. And so figuring out how they can press levers at work. And so that's the, there's a drawdown at work. There's just climate solutions just at work I threw in there. So again, this different ways to think about these things. Mark, I wanna uh, raise something you, you to talk to us about and then talk about faculties, which to think about what faculty need. But you talked about a letters from the future, and I've done that in other venues and as a futurist, uh, a future workshop. And uh, I thought it was a very powerful imagining what a world might be look like might look like if it were more green, if we really address climate change. Uh, might one describe that, and then also. Uh, one of the things you did was uh, you shared that what faculty needed most was uh, to address their own ignorance about this and really like to uh, uh, talk first about letters for the future because that's really a way of engaging students or from the future, I'm sorry. But then also talk about how you got faculty to sign up and what you found their greatest needs were. All right. Um... Uh, one of the things, if you do get a chance to watch Sophia's video, she talks about how uh, coming into class, she felt really small and all of her, her colleagues felt really small. Um, but by doing something about this, they came out feeling so much better about it. Um, and so that that idea that, that Brian was mentioning of getting students engaged in the pedagogy, um, not necessarily activism, but just engaged themselves in doing this thing. Um, and I, I recognize the student's anxiety about all of this and can be incredibly overwhelming and it can be incredibly daunting to be thinking about this. And you would normally think about a class that, like I teach, you would come in and say, okay, we want to come up with a climate solution. Let's propose something. Let's figure out what it would look like, how we get it enacted, how we're going to pass it through the levels of government. And it just sounds like a, an entire slog to students um, and they get really depressed and they think about all the things that are going to go wrong and all the people that aren't going to let them do it and, and, and be that way. And so it, it just is this mountain to climb that they just can't really imagine. And so what I've done is, is come up with another solution. The idea is called dispatches from the future. And what they do is they write about the climate problem as it's already been solved. How did it work? How is it working? What great things are coming out of it? And it's a great way to think about it and creatively, but the psychology is so powerful. It's now looking at from the top of the mountain, looking down rather than the bottom of the mountain, looking up. And they really need to be looking down on these things. They can't always be looking up at, at just, uh, it's just it's a horrible climb. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, Ashley's right that, you know, this is a long-term thing they have to think about. They are going to be climbing, but we don't need to start with vertical. <laughs> and uh, give them some other way to get onto these types of things. Um, and, and faculty want to engage uh, their students, but faculty are really bothered when they don't have the answers. And, and even when questions are outside their field, it just that's not a faculty thing we really enjoy. And so they really wanted to be able to offer their students something um, to talk about this, preferably about what their course is on, right? That's what they really were looking for. And so we tried to put out all kinds of different things that no matter who was looking at it, they, they could do this. Um, we had art professors know what, what could we offer them? And so we shared with them warming stripes. Um, it's what artist Ed Hawkins is a visual representation of the climate, uh, changing climate uh, in the world. Uh, show your stripes is this big uh, effort that you can do. And it's an artistic way to be thinking about this. Um, women's studies professors wanted to know what to offer their students. And so we shared with them the wonderful book, All We Can Save, which is composed entirely by female authors and edited by Katherine Wilkinson. Um, Dr. Wilkinson's also a professor and so she's created this great website loaded with different curricular applications to do that. And while we're here, just shout out Women's uh, Day today. Um, we also talked about climate justice, right? And one of the big uh, uh, questions coming out of this is really that representation matters. 
um, whose story are we telling? Um, storytelling was really a thread that ran through all the disciplines. All the disciplines can see the benefits of stories. So we shared a lot of sites that showed different people's stories, right? It's really that representation matters. Um, I shared the site. We've got all these resources out there. Um, I encourage folks to look at them. But I think the thing that faculty needed most um, was someone to talk to. Um, they needed each other. And that was really the, the goal of the disciplinary breakout rooms. They provided faculty to talk with other people who understood their discipline, right? Who could then talk about, hey, this is how we could use it. Here's how I could use it. Here's what you could do. Um, and they allowed them to then build community. And I think that's a big important thing for faculty in this. Um, faculty also have their own climate anxiety. They have to have their own ways to talk about this stuff. And so this was a great one. And it was great because a lot of faculty have stayed engaged um, after the year and they're all getting their colleagues to sign up for the next one. So that's inspiring as well. That's really exciting what you've been able to do. Uh, Brian and Ashley, what are you, how have you seen faculty engage in this? Uh, we have, uh, we'll talk in a minute, but we have uh, climate, uh, like Colorado College, that's made a whole institution-wide commitment uh, to climate. Um, there are others that have done that, others that have uh, built uh, climate pledges. But uh, I've often heard the biggest barrier to innovation in higher education is faculty unwillingness to change and a pedagogy that no longer suits the needs of the content that we need to address. So where, where can we promote and how can we engage more faculty uh, in making this, uh, being able to have a discourse about human security, climate change, uh, these hyper objects as Mark describes them. Mm -hmm. um, Any I'll, thoughts, I'll, I'll lead yes, and then I'll, I'll happily hand it over to, to Brian, who's always pushing the right. boundaries on this. Um, gosh, I, I, I come from faculty, I'm a sociologist by training. Um, I. I think faculty get a get a bad rap for for not being incentivized to move outside of their comfort zone and to do things that are not rewarded with frankly within our institutions and more broadly across higher education. So um, where there is often pockets of resistance are frankly, in my mind, more about a lack of gratitude or encouragement for what it means to do exactly what Mark is describing, which is to get uncomfortable, to not know the answers, to try something and to fail. There's very little supports on campuses to do that. There was just a, an article in, in a report that came out from Inside Higher Education on provosts that it, and among the findings was the appetite um, for faculty development on campuses and very and the the amount of resources that are actually being provided to to incentivize that in addition to the ways in which we've structured the tenure the tenure system to do that we are at a point where picking up on your earlier point Ralph we are at a point where we know so much about high impact practices um, as my colleague Randy Bass would say we know far more about what it means to to encourage learning. And then, then we have in terms of our, how we've expanded our notions of teaching. We know what effective learning is. We have not caught up in terms of the structures that actually reward innovations in teaching. We have to get to that place. And, and I will drop in, just as I, I stop talking, I will, I will drop in a link to um, a whole issue that we devoted to climate change last summer. And I will add our award-winning magazine, Liberal Education through AAC and U. And it's just it's just chocked full of fantastic examples of campuses that are working very hard and taking considerations uh, among this. But at the end of the day, they will they will be a, maybe you know a large handful. Or the idea that um, faculty work very hard in isolation that we can find pockets of the innovation, but far less around connectedness of the pedagogies and across communities of practice. So that's where that's where we really need to change the mindset and change the institutional will behind these issues. I do think we need, <clears throat> I know that many junior faculty are told just focus uh, <laughs> on your research. And, uh, but we do need new pedagogies that will engage students and bring them in. And that's going to take a lot of support from the, from the campus leadership. And I do think this is where American higher education 
has a lot to offer the diversity of approaches uh, that we work with and the high impact practices. Brian, how, what's been your experience in interviewing faculty? Uh, well, well, so far, I, 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 a few different points. I mean, one is uh, I love Ashley's point about the importance of being uncomfortable. Um, and Mark's point about uh, the challenge of faculty risking not being the expert. Uh, th these are these are challenging positions, and they require campus support to do that. Um, the the great thinker Donna Haraway has this slogan of asking us to stay with the trouble, and I, I think that's something that we can model uh, for our students and community. To to go back to teaching, uh, I love Mark's future assignment. I mean, as a futurist, of course, I'm happy with this. Um, and there are a lot of futures exercises we can do. And it shows the power of futures thinking. But it also shows uh, an interesting interdisciplinary work in that it, it relies on the field of imaginative literature. Um, and uh, also, it, we we already have a body of of climate fiction of novels, stories, movies, TV shows, which are showing possible futures uh, that we can draw on. Uh, I think there are other pedagogies that we should uh, recall. Some of them are traditional. Uh, so thinking about problem-based learning, thinking about inquiry-based learning, uh, those can be very effective for trying to teach aspects of the climate crisis. I, I would also put in a vote here for simulations and games. Uh, we already have examples of these that are created by faculty, some that are used by faculty, but these are really interesting ways to get students thinking about complexity and systems. Uh, I, I think faculty also, you know, we we have a nominal commitment to interdisciplinary work, but still the lion's share of incentives and reinforcements and professional identity come from within disciplines. And I think institutions have to think carefully about how to support interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. And that's everything from supporting grad students who do this, who normally don't have that kind of support uh, through faculty. And that includes especially adjunct faculty in the United States. That's the preponderance of our faculty. And, and they have very little support in general to begin with. Uh, we also have to think about other institutional structures. Should we have a climate center on campus, for example? Should we set up climate studies programs or you know, in general or with some you know, slices of the larger uh, pie? Should we set up climate schools? I mean, if, if, our, if we take the climate crisis as seriously as those who study it say we should, then yeah, we should start having schools of climate change, schools of, of climate mitigation. Uh, I, we also have to figure out how to protect our faculty and students and staff uh, politically, because this is such a contentious field. Uh, we've already seen this with the famous Climate Gate uh, release of emails, which led to death threats, doxing, and more. Uh, I think we need institutions need to be very aware of this and to support faculty, as Ashley recommends. And I think uh, trying to facilitate community is is very challenging, but crucial. And Mark gave great examples of breakouts by disciplines and departments, as well as people just putting their minds together. Uh, one, one last note here. I think uh, we need to make sure that institutions support faculty who are supporting students doing research. Uh, graduate students, of course, that's the you know, in many ways the focus of their of their experience. And that's going to need some support if we're going to be able to produce quickly the next generation of faculty and staff that we need. But also in the liberal arts tradition, uh, there's a tradition of undergraduate research. And again, I think that's going to be very, very rewarding as long as institutions support that effectively. So I guess that's part of my theme here is a combination of imagination and support. You know, I'm thinking, uh, and I wonder, Mark, has, uh, you had 75 courses, you say, that were modified. Did it lead to uh, more interdisciplinarity or did uh, faculty working together, team taught courses? I know that uh, one of the points that have been made is this is such an inner and transdisciplinary hyper object, as you described. There's so many dimensions to it. Um, we tend to think more of the science than all of the other impacts of this, which are everywhere. Um, but did uh, did the faculty learning community engage in trying to build greater interdisciplinarity, or do you see that's a step for the future, or not at uh, all? No, yes, uh, but we did it in two ways. We did it, I guess, a little bit. We We tried to build interdisciplinarity as a way of building community. Um, and so what we did is we had uh, breakout rooms on Zoom that were by discipline. And this was really to let all of these folks talk to somebody else in their discipline, really get some nuts and bolts stuff going. 
And then we have meetings on campuses by campus by campus basis. And so all the six campuses also had their own meetings. And we had lunches to share what we were learning, share what was happening, what different stuff we found in our just some different breakout rooms, but also then talk about visiting each other's classes or sharing some things. You know, one of the things that uh, we have to remember is that faculty also share students. And usually the way that other students learn about faculty is not from other faculty, but from other students. And so often trying to figure out ways to share each other's students or do joint student projects, to bring them together. Um, so those, those are the types of ways that we tried to build it. Um, but I think it really is that interdisciplinarity comes with, with community as well. I wanted to, uh, so much of this, particularly protecting faculty, as Brian, you were describing in some settings where uh, it is a controversial topic um, in some uh, universities, some states, uh, it may vary from de department to department as much as uh, university or college or state. Um, protecting the faculty requires an institutional commitment. I want to kind of focus on institutional leadership. Um, today, I work with a lot of presidents of universities and who in turn work for boards who are increasingly politicized around ideology and what's called woke or not woke or, or the need to address the new demographic depending, uh, it becomes more a political spectrum issue than what's really happening to our world issue. Um, but I see there are many institutions that have made an institution-wide commitment that is often around facilities, green energy, endowment investments, but it isn't necessarily uh, penetrated all the way into all the disciplines, uh, the academic disciplines, the way, Mark, you've described your faculty learning community. So I wonder how we might engage institutions to formalize their commitments and to move the commitments beyond, if you will, the low-hanging fruit, which are the energy policies, uh, to really talk about uh, this is real and we have to engage it and know that it may not be, uh, or it may be, let me put it this way, uncomfortable and controversial for boards of trustees who manage, uh, who are in the U.S., uh, oversee the institutions, public and private. And it's often uncomfortable for the boards to see the institution get into controversy and uh, hold presidents accountable if that controversy is too too great. Uh, how do you think we can address this? Uh, because the protection of faculty, the institutional commitment, the relationship with communities, all the things you describe can easily be stifled if there's not at the level of the provost, uh, the chief academic officer, or the president to really stand behind uh, their faculty and their own institution's commitments. What are your thoughts about that? What have you learned? <laughs> what have you what's been? I know Cal State Chico has on its website a full commitment to climate change. I don't know if that's true for all Cal State campuses as a board, uh, system-wide board policy. Um, and Brian, you've talked about meeting with presidents who said that uh, they really can't raise this issue. Well, it's, uh, it's at, the, at the presidential level, it can be very, very tricky because climate change is completely politicized and it looks like a very risky uh, step to take for a president to get involved with a lot of risks and not a lot of upside is what I'm seeing in some cases. I, I, I heard one president tell me that uh, half of, of, of his population was based in a uh, fracking country and uh, the people there were very passionate about fracking. They saw it as a, as a huge um, uh, support for them um, and a way forward for them. And the other half of his population was based in urban uh, university towns and, uh, and they were very, very green. So I asked, well, how do you how do you balance these two post worlds? And he says, well, I don't say anything. Um, and then quietly, I help people get grants. Um, 
so I, I wouldn't call that necessarily a kind of profile and courage, but it's it's it it helps illustrate some of the tensions, some of the problems. I, I had to give a talk in Texas a few years ago and about the future of education, and I was going to mention climate change, and they told me, please don't. Our state has prohibited that from being said in public universities. I said it anyway. I, I didn't get in too much trouble, but but the, these are just some examples, and and we should expect more and more uh, challenges. Um, I mean, you think about that this can occur at all kinds of interesting levels. This can occur at the level of the immediate community. Uh, I, I worked with one university which was trying very hard to set up a solar site right off campus. I mean, like a block away on, on an area of waste ground. And initially the community supported it. And then parts of the community organized against it and ultimately blocked it. Um, we have to think as well about, uh, you know, cities and how they handle funding, uh, as well as the different ways that we can have productive co uh, connections. And beyond cities, thinking about uh, provinces, thinking about states. Uh, and I mean, you know, one of the benefits I, I was I was telling Mark is that he's in California, where the state government has consistently taken a leadership role in the climate crisis, I think arguably further than any other state in the U.S. Uh, and that's a great benefit. Uh, you think about how that can play out in state systems in California, the CSU system, the community college system, the UC system. Uh, we need to have a lot of intelligence at the university level to see how these changes are happening in order to really have our engagement be carefully situated and calibrated. Um, but we should also expect a lot more change along these lines uh, across politics as different parties scrambled to try to take into account different dimensions of this, uh, but also in terms of culture, uh, how different uh, mass movements may appear, how different uh, other cultural factors, storytelling, but also religion, and then businesses, how businesses actually try and implement uh, different climate goals. I mean, there's the risk of greenwashing, there's uh, climate denial, but also businesses trying to transform themselves. I, I think COVID gave us quite a few lessons to learn. The great scientist, or sorry, the great scholar Bruno Latour uh, raised the idea that we should think of COVID as a kind of dress rehearsal for climate change. And that's where we learned that we will politicize the heck out of any science. Um, and I don't just mean one group politicizing. I mean, this is a popular sport for everyone to play. Uh, so we are seeing this with with the pen, with um, uh, climate change, but also I think we learned a lot of crisis uh, governance lessons. Uh, how do you run a campus when you know you're partially off campus? How do you put together very disparate strains of thinking from public health to uh, economics to uh, technology? And I think we learned a lot about governance there that we might be able to apply going ahead. I do want to echo, if I can repeat myself quickly to remember that the majority of people on campuses do not have tenure's protection. Uh, I mean, that is, the, you, depending on the campus, often the majority of faculty don't, but also staff do not and students do not. Uh, so trying to engage with these issues, uh, I think we have to, if we're gonna risk being uncomfortable, we also have to have the support where we can protect ourselves as we take steps in this, arguably the greatest crisis facing civilization right now. Uh, there is a, I will just say there is a great deal of, uh, uh, having listened to a number of the other sessions in this conference, there's a great deal that uh, has been added with respect to specific disciplines, student voices, and the like. It's going to take all of us to address this. And uh, um, Mark, you were going to say that? Yeah, I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about CSU. I just posted, uh, we do have a sustainability policy for the entire CSU, um, but there's 23 campuses and there's a big range of those campuses, right? And those campuses include the campus of CSU Bakersfield, right next to the town of Oildale. Um, there is a pump jack on this, the, the, the campus at Bakersfield. So we, we also have these difficulties. Um, but one of the neat things we were able to do is that by broadcasting throughout the whole CSU, we broadcast Brit Ray's talk to every campus, and we had people in Bakersfield streaming in, you know, behind enemy lines, as I like to say. Uh, so, you know, we, we there are opportunities to reach those folks as well. And so um, even though we're, we're great in California, we, we still have difficulties within that large of a system. We um, were Ashley, I know you all have a president's trust. You've been working with presidents. You've mentioned to me uh, in some states, even the word liberal can be a controversial word. 
Uh, Fox News in the U.S. has made liberal a very damning term uh, in every other dimension, not but only not, but also higher education. Um, so how how can we address because uh, climate change is uh, only part of the human security migration, all warfare, the nuclear threat. There are so many dimensions to this that our students and faculty are facing. How have, how have you all been trying to cross the divide that exists? Let me pick up on, on something Brian mentioned, which is almost, um, and and I, I don't mean this lightly, but almost a, a lack of safety, a perceived real lack of safety to speak out. And when we talk about presidential leadership on campuses, I think it's almost irresponsible to say that this is a time for bold leadership without adding that it's also a dangerous time for bold leadership. So one of the way we have had many conversations about this in our president's trust group, with which, which is a group of about 600 presidents that have signed on to you know, basically advocate for this mission of liberal education in the form in which that comes. And, and I, I think one of what, what I what I guess what I'm hearing and what I love about the examples that both Mark and Brian have raised is is there are ways for campuses to think big, medium and small, maybe, in how they're thinking about disruption and how they're thinking about equipping students with these capacities. So, you know, big public statements on divestment from fossil fuels is is a is significant one. Right. But we should also, and this kind of brings us full circle to the beginning of the conversation, we also think about the capacities to simply speak across difference, to simply acknowledge the fact that we are educating students to have conversations with people who think differently from themselves. And I'm thinking about um, some examples of, of what we might say is bold leadership, but in ways that are um, that can still be supported within the framework of the education, educational mission of the institution. I'm thinking about John Alger, for example, at James Madison University, that's they that, that they have just released a really wonderful video around free speech and speaking across difference. Um, and it's all students. It's all students talking about that, just from their perspective, that they want to have the right to be on a campus in which they can be allowed to talk with each other and engage those differences. Um, all the way from Virginia to Utah. So Weber State University has a program that, in, uh, that works with Unify America to pair students from different political spectrums and political ideologies to have conversations across ver you know, various topics in which they're probably going to see it differently, but, uh, but aligns those dialogues and conversations and then centers assignments and, and, and uh, projects around those kinds of experiences. So it's, it's in my mind, and I think in, in our mind and how we're catalyzing those conversations among leadership and then all the, all the way through to faculty and staff and down to students is, is how do we think big, medium, and small in this kind of a climate um, so to speak, uh, both on campuses and then broadly and globally. But how do we actually support those kinds of uh, different efforts to right, get at similar objectives? I think that these are, it, I don't know if you have a link to that uh, free speech video. I think that at least for those of us in the U.S., that might be really valuable. I, I don't know to what extent <laughs> um, that... I, I think this is a global issue for my colleagues that I know in Europe, that uh, there, there are lots of uh, conversations going on on all sides of the political spectrum uh, and more protests. If you look at France for any change or uh, the nurses in, uh, in Britain and uh, England. Um, and, you know, if there are anyone who has any questions out there in the in the, the world, uh, we'd be glad to have them add in the chat. I'm, one of the things I, I will, I'd will i like to ask is, um, I started this inquiry thinking we needed a new paradigm for higher education to, uh, to think about scale. And talking with all of you, it, it both gave me a lot of hope because I believe that higher education, at least in the US, uh, moves more by emulation than innovation, or it moves by both. And it, it's really important to know there are examples that people can follow 
Um, but it's hard to find bold restructuring of at least traditional higher education because it's so deeply embedded in disciplinarity, faculty tenure, graduate preparation that is organized around the disciplines. But so much of this seems to be around content, so much seems to be around pedagogy. And what I do wonder is, have you seen dramatic new approaches to this? I mean, it uh, or is there, do we, I mean, each of you seem to be working as I have when I ran an accrediting agency around working within, chain, building change within institutions and building on the creativity that exists within institutions, even as we try to support bold and highly innovative institutions. But it's been hard to make them at scale. Uh, there are some like Southern New Hampshire that have been able to move to scale 150,000 students plus uh, others. But is it a new paradigm? Uh, how do you how do we balance the need for something bold and new versus changing the system within? And what are your what are your thoughts about that? I mean, one of the challenges that we haven't mentioned in making such a transformation is that faculty and staff are are so exhausted. Uh, we're coming off of three years of a global pandemic, which we're trying our best not to think about anymore. But um, the impact of that is, is astonishing. I mean, every every record of a pandemic I found dating back to Roman times always has this pattern of initial shock and horror and then numbness um, and exhaustion. And people accept a whole amount of destruction. And that's where we are now. And our faculty did tremendous, our staff did tremendous work over the past few years without any extra resources, without any extra time. Plus, depending on where you are in the globe, you may have a whole series of political and cultural issues you're trying to grapple with at the same time. So I, I, when I talk to faculty about climate, I often get this kind of uh, response, you know, oh God, another thing to think about. Um, but, but, um, I, I do think that we have the chance to rethink quite a bit of education. And I, one way that comes is from economics. Uh, there's now this ferment in economics to figure out if we should stop growth, uh, if we should rethink how we assess and understand the economy beyond GDP. And this is very interesting. And this is where economics, excuse me, academics can play a major role in these kind of debates, both in public and in professional spaces. But it brings rise to an interesting question. To what extent is higher education predicated on the promise of eternal growth? In the United States, we massively expanded our enrollment and our faculty and staff numbers from about 1980 to 2012. Uh, and our growth stopped in 2012. And we've shrunk ever since in terms of student numbers. Um, is that a preview that we should think about a smaller academic footprint? Uh, that's a huge, huge act of reimagination to, to go through. But there's also the, a second domain, which is the area of decolonization, the idea that we should be listening to the voices that the colonial process of the past 200 plus years have marginalized. And in that case, among other things, there is the idea of paying a lot more attention to indigenous ways of knowing and being in the world. Uh, partly for this decolonial purpose, but also because these aren't peoples who managed to create global warming. Uh, so perhaps we see a new way of integrating native knowledge, indigenous knowledge into our pedagogy, into our research. I mean, that's a that's a massive sea change to think about. But those are a few ways. Uh, there's there's a question from Gary Jacobs. Uh, Ralph, do you want us to address that or should uh, should my colleagues say smarter things in response to your good question? I, I'm going to jump in on the on the question real quickly um, and bring a, a an insight from Project Drawdown um, in the things that they're thinking about. Because when we're thinking about climate solutions, we could think about all the new things that we could develop. But one of the the, the insights from Drawdown is now is more important than new. Um, and I would argue that we need to be integrating now into the curriculum, doing the things that we can do now. And we can think about a new paradigm, but we need to be working within the paradigm we have now. There's just so much we could do now. So I guess that, you know, uh, uh, dramatizing it too much, but this idea of something new, we could spend all time talking and worrying about that, but we got to do things now. And I think just integrating, the, the thing that climate change allows us, this is again, Timothy Morton's idea, is it really 
forces us to rethink these things. This isn't something we're going to have to do. It's forcing us to rethink them. And um, so th that idea is we rethink them. Sure, we need to be thinking about it differently, but we need to be getting into the classroom and changing what we already teach. We're already teaching these topics are already talked about. How do we integrate climate change into them? So now it's, it's certainly it's not an issue for the it, it is an issue for the future, but it is one that we are experiencing every day. Uh, whether it's climate change, global warming, uh, there are so many dimensions to it. Um, I do want to, Ashley may want to add, I also want to uh, mark, uh, note Gary's question, which is, could we paraphrase that every, every class ought to be a climate class to human security, to the even expanding the frame to the larger issues that uh, human security encompasses, would that be also an appropriate frame, or is it even that too big uh, for students to comprehend? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll jump in quickly, because I think I can weave in part of Gary's question into this, which is, well, sure you can, I, sure you can. I mean, you you can do anything that you're putting institutional resources for, and, and if it's in finding authentic connections within the institution and within that mission. I think what Mark has described uh, at Georgetown, they have a similar program, and they're called the curricular infusion programs. They're really, they're really effective and they're really smart, but you've still got to find ways to reward that. And I think one of one of the things I wanted to add in this conversation, because it's a question of scale is it becomes imperative to have conversations about why this is complementary and supportive of existing work and not new work. So Ralph, you raised, you, you had a really important point that I don't wanna let escape, accreditation. You know, how do these efforts fit into existing efforts within the institution? How do they fit into accreditation efforts? If you're at a Southern school in the South, is this part of your quality enhancement plan, for example? Is this a focus of one of the innovative pedagogies that you're going to write into your accreditation report? How are you weaving this into assessment protocols that you already have and are already required to do? Um, how do you connect this with efforts on just about every campus to get students meaningful jobs? We started with that. If every job is going to be a climate job, then connect that make those linkages. So instead of jumping in and doing the what feels like the, the the hard work of like getting the program going, I would encourage campuses to stop and do the hard work up front of simply making sense of how it works with existing efforts so that faculty are actually reminded that this is this is part of the stream and not a whole new river <laughs> that they're that they're trying to paddle down. So yeah, that's really helpful. And I tell you, my own experience is uh, uh, with accreditation, which I agree has powerful influence by the framing of its standards and what it looks at. You know, it's like uh, what you measure is what is paid attention to. And um, accrediting agencies tend to be agnostic around the curriculum as long as faculty control it. And now we're seeing real issues about faculty control. But faculty need to be pushed to both, both examples, but also with initiatives that make this important, whether it's climate change or human security. And I will say that um, professional associations uh, really could play a very important role, um, not just through accreditation, but um, how we define what it means to be a professional in developing the educational experience, I think is really going to be important. And I do think that uh, we've been talking about climate change, and uh, but I, I, I want to go back to Gary's question. I have to say that I think the value of this whole idea of human security is that it's so multidimensional that climate change creates climate migration. It's going to be the US military is planning a future in which there will be climate wars. We know that water in the Middle East in so many places, India and China, the drying up of the glaciers in the Himalayas. Um, there are so many different dimensions to this that um, you can call there's almost no label for it and human security for all is an all-encompassing term i think the what what you all bring to me i will say and i think to others is 
inspiration that there are people really working on this, writing about it, challenging both the specifics of climate change, but I would also say, uh, Ashley, as what AACNU is doing, the deeper thinking, the deep thinking, the kind of the addressing for global citizenship, global leadership, bold leadership from students, faculty, and leaders at the institution, that this is a multi-dimensional problem that's going to require not just hard science, but it's going to require everybody trying to figure out what their own piece will be. I would say that um, your comment earlier about meaning and purpose is really relevant. Uh, Mark, you commented that students, I think there's a phrase you, you might, what is it about between faculty, the faculty and students have a very different perspective on this? How is that you framed that? Do you recall? I, I, how I said it now, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, well, you remember you said that uh, faculty are of an age, we are of an age where climate change is something that we don't have to be concerned about, but for the students, they're living, they're living it and they're live, going to live uh, into it. Yeah. And so the fact that we, let's put it, uh, we can't ignore it because our job of preparing students for the future has to incorporate this into pedagogy, into the curriculum and how we're going to address it and how to deal with the emotional, the climate dread you talked about it, anxiety how we're going to deal with the mental health and emotional issues of seeing the world in which we grew up in be dramatically changed by global warming, I, I think is something that um, we have an accountability and a responsibility to address. So uh, I don't know if there is anything else. I think um, every faculty, every staff member should be climate workers. Does anyone want to comment on that? Just as we close, is that well? I just think it's happening, and whether they wanted to or not, everyone's having to deal with this. Um, all our staff are now cleaning up after the flood that we just had. So uh, yeah, everyone's a everyone's a climate worker now. <laughs> well, in some sense, by even denying we're a climate worker, right? I mean, in the sense by ignoring it, we can't, but it has well, an impact. It's it's tricky. I mean, I mean, this the, there's this there's this terrifying force of inevitability that the climate you know as we bust through a two percent temperature increase, our two degree temperature increase, that we're going to be facing more and more escalating and and the question is, uh, do we do this reactively and belatedly, or do we do it thoughtfully with foresight, strategically now? Um, I mean, I'm I'm posing this as a kind of no brainer question because it really is. Uh, and this is a great moment uh, to seize the day and to be active. As, well, as we like to talk all. about here at Chico, uh, our, our carbon footprint for the campus is pretty small, but our, our academic footprint is huge. And uh, that's what we really should be working on. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Many more Chico states. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hope this panel and the rest of the conference will contribute to that. I would also say that there are allies, uh, I've, as I've listened to other parts of this conference, there are allies everywhere, and we need to align ourselves with them, both in the U.S. and abroad. This is truly a global issue, and sending a rocket ship to Mars won't solve it. So. I uh, look forward to continuing to work with you all. Thank you all very much. And